Hello, this is Danny Raymond, the voice behind Ray's Guide. A week ago, when CIG released Inside Star Sizz and Design Brief Cargo Part 1, I decided to hold off my analysis until I saw Part 2. Which, unlike Server Meshing Summit Part 2, which we have yet to see, they did actually release the Part 2 this week. And I'm going to start by coining a new bit of Star Citizen fan jargon, the exploding toilet. Exploding toilets are a bit like sandworms, another bit of Star Citizen fan jargon, to denote a flashy thing shown in a keynote speech that is nowhere near as real or ready as its appearance in the keynote would suggest. The term, of course, comes from the 2016 CizenCon, but you can also say that the jump point to Pyro in 2019 was also a sandworm. Exploding toilets are when a video team visualizes a concept in a way that suggests the concept, but in no way represents what will actually be in the game, such as when they said you would need to manage your resource allocation on a ship or systems would fail, they showed an exploding toilet, while there is no intent, however, to create a simulated plumbing system on our ships. I go into all this background for one simple reason, to point out that virtually everything shown on the design brief videos that didn't say playable now was an exploding toilet. So inferring anything about them is mistaken. In fact, implementing them exactly how was shown would be a very bad idea for reasons I will get into as we go on. The concept of the difference between instance and persistent hangers might seem difficult, but I was reminded of an example from a building that was very central to my first years after exiting architecture school, Los Angeles International Airport. At LAX, Terminals 7 and 8 are essentially owned by United Airlines. They were built specifically for them and have been maintained and upgraded and operated by them for more than 70 years. If one United Airlines employee leaves a piece of equipment out of position at a gate at Terminal 7, it stays out of position. On the other hand, Zip Air, yes, I hadn't heard of them either, operates one flight per day at LAX to and from Tokyo. There is no Zip Air terminal LAX. There isn't even a Zip Air gate or even a Zip Air ticket counter. A short while before the flight arrives at Bradley International Terminal, the gate and ticket counter are assigned, which may not be the one assigned yesterday or tomorrow, and shortly after departure, the gate and ticket counter is cleaned up for the next flight by the staff at Bradley International Terminal. If a Zip Air personnel leaves something out of place at the gate, it won't be there tomorrow because the Zip Air gate might be someplace else tomorrow. And even if it was the same, several other flights have gone through since then. And that's the difference. United Airlines Terminal 7, persistent hangers. Zip Air, instance hanger. Now, way back when the hangar demonstration module was first introduced to the game, there was an ongoing debate on the old forums, the predecessors of Spectrum, of how these would someday get implemented into the persistent universe. One group was the Magic Carousel, where miles and miles and miles of entire hangars were buried in the ground for no apparent need and then lifted as entire buildings up to the surface. This was derided as utter nonsense that nobody would build or operate such an expensive and complex thing if there was an available space to do it any other way, which is true. The other group said the planets are huge, just spread them across the landscape and have some form of aerial or enclosed transitway that takes you from there to the terminal. Again, a system that many airports already use. This was derided as wonk evaders and said would be an eyesore. Which is also true. Now, it seems like the NAPU team is taking the direction of the magic door, but at least so far are just letting what it represents as a physical reality be hand wavium, which is good. Let it be. Lore team, if they come to you and ask you to write up some lore explaining the magic door system, just say no. Some things are best left as hand wavium. You would just be digging yourself an ever deeper hole both logically and physically. By trying to come up with an in-game rationalization of the regen system, you did not make it more sensible. You only made it more silly. I repeat, some things are best left as hand wavium. The magic hanger is one of them. Now, there are a number of concerns with hangers and manual loading. One of them is how do you manually load something like a Hercules or a Caterpillar at a place like SMO 18 or R Corp 157 without being horribly vulnerable for far too long? You don't. On the other hand, a drug lab wouldn't make sense to have huge hangers. It doesn't. Right now, we essentially have three tiers of places. We have outposts, stations, and cities. My suggestion is that the outpost category be split and that we have outposts, depots, stations, and cities. 
most of the outposts that have large landing pads would be upgraded to depots with hangars. The remaining outposts would be capped at never wanting to sell or buy more than 96 SCU of anything to any one individual. They will be destinations for delivery and for cargo in ships like the Hull A, Base Freelancer, and Raft. When you buy there, one or more of the large containers near the station will unlock containing your stuff, and then when you sell, an empty large cargo container unlocks for you to unload into. You're still vulnerable, but only for a short time, and not so valuable as to attract too much attention. The depots, on the other hand, will sell up to 1,000 SCU to any individual and have instance hangers up to Hercules or Caterpillar size. There are no persistent hangers at depots. Now, honestly, though, the most exciting thing about the whole discussion about having hangers was the idea that a persistent hanger or hangers would be the centerpiece of your user-constructed bases. Great. Continuing, though, on the subject of hangers, there's a subject that I think CIG needs to get out in front of now rather than later, because if they wait to the actual implementation, it will cause a crap storm. And that is exactly what exactly have we been buying with our ships, because CIG has sold a lot of add-on ships, and every one of these ships has included, in what's included, a hanger. So a lot of people will look at their account and think, well, they own a lot of hangers. Now, someone pointed out to me an old, old, old 10 for the chairman segment where Chris Roberts said that there'd be one persistent hanger per game and account, and the others where hanger would just be landing rights at essentially an instance hanger. The problem is we have, over the course of many years, come to presume that being able to land at any place we visit is a presumed ability, and that not only that, but the descriptions of the hanger included with our game package is the same as the description that comes with the add-on ship. So here is what I'm going to suggest that CIG says. Each one of these hangers you bought with your initial game package or with an add-on ship could be a permanent hanger at a station or city, but no more than one per station or city, or they could instead be used as part of your personal base at no limit per location. We suspect that players will enjoy the idea of walking from hangar to hangar on their base and see their entire fleet in a physicalized but protected way. This keeps the hangers valuable and encourages players to build their own headquarters bases when that feature becomes available, hopefully soon. Next up, the manual loading of cargo, which is already causing some grumbles. And I personally like the 3D Tetris game of being a loadmaster, but I also score in the 99th percentile in 3D spatial reasoning although that only put me in the middle of class in architecture school. But people like what that comes to them easy and naturally. Funny thing, and I'm good at 3D visualization. But by definition, 99 out of 100 people aren't in the 99th percentile, and I'm too busy to be load master to 99 other players. So we already have in 3.20 a good automated packing algorithm. So by all means, that must be preserved like for the folks who don't find manually packing coming to them easy and naturally like I do. And there is a fairly easy way to do this. Cargo purchased for a ship in storage uses automated loading. Cargo purchased for a ship retrieved in hangar is manually loaded. When you choose the destination for your cargo purchase, it will tell you if it's stored or retrieved and it'll let you change it to the other state. If they would rather keep the freight terminal in the hangar, the focal point, then it's the same thing. Be able to direct the freight to the elevator or to the ship in storage. The ASOP terminal will, just like if there's a claim timer, show a loading timer. And again, just like there's an expedite button for the claim timer, there would be an expedite button for the load timer. Simple. The unexpedited load timer should be slower than a skilled manual loading, and an expedited load timer would be faster than a skilled manual loading. And yes, this should apply to the hull C as well. Watching the crates pop in one by one is interesting for the first three or five times. I would rather shorten the runaround and just store the hull C, buy the cargo, wait for the timer, expedite it if I wish, and then retrieve the hull C already loaded to the docking port. Now, in order to make the manual loading of cargo work with the new variety of crate sizes, we need to have a couple features that we don't already have in 3.20. For all I know, they're already working on them, but if not, here they are. First, merge. If I'm transloading from a number of smaller ships, let's say cutlasses, into a Hercules, I want to simplify a lot of the containers of the same contents into larger sizes for easier management. Second, as you might have guessed, split. 
The 32 SCU containers are convenient as long as you aren't trying to load into a small ship or one that is already mostly full. Now, if the container has something weird inside it, like a torpedo, then splitting, of course, isn't practical. But most of these situations are in fact going to be handled by the next two. In the video, they showed all sorts of odds and ends, ships, suits, vehicles, picos, whatever, just stuck to the cargo grid, however. This I sincerely, deeply hope turns out to be an exploding toilet. Please, audience, you want this to be an exploding toilet. Napu team, if you're watching this, do not try to program this. Treat this as an exploding toilet that you not only don't have to do, but shouldn't do. The reason, one word, is polygons. Stick 10 ships or vehicles on each spindle face and everybody's graphics cards will be baking like an 81 ship battle, but all the time. So this is where the next two features come in. Three, palletize. This feature takes whatever ship, vehicle, etc., and replaces it with a rectangular base of the appropriate number of grid units and an arched cover with the right proportions covered with a tarp and cargo netting texture. Hundreds, if not thousands of polys get replaced with maybe a dozen. Not only that, but it's much easier to see how the cargo can fit on the grid. And then, fourth, obviously there needs to be an unpalletized capability, which replaces the wrapped pallet with the original ship, vehicle, or whatever. Now, to wrap up with the thing that they wrapped up with, the subscriber item recovery lost and found. This is not too different from the solution I proposed a while back when the whole thing first hit the fan except that I did not make it a diegetic function because if there is no in-game reason why you own these things in the first place, which there isn't, then there's no need for a diegetic reason why you get them back, which means you won't be limited by logic from putting controls on it. And absolutely you have to put controls on it or everybody will soon have all the subscriber stuff for free from duplication and so why pay for it? And paying for it is the reason why they have subscriber stuff. So, what limits? Well, any subscriber item possessed by anyone other than the original owner will be labeled somehow as unoriginal, such as secondhand or duplicate. They'll have inferior statistics to the generic item and would only sell for only a fraction of what the generic item would sell for. In addition, of course, those items do not get returned to the lost and found. Finally, the lost and found has a time at which gets longer the more frequently the lost and found feature gets used in general and not the specific item. So the incentive is to put off using it until there is something you have an urgency to recover. Now you can say those limits aren't logical in the game world, but there's no logic in the game world to why you have these items at all. So now for some of our giveaways. First of all, the winner of the hull seat, the colossal car container carrying craft. First, we spin for the winner of which video it will come from. My criticism of the 2.18 tutorial and the winning member or commenter from that video is member Mark Booser. Contact me in the email in the channel contents page and we can get the whole C delivered to your account. And we still have the ongoing contest that will happen during the IAE Expo for in just a couple weeks. For your choice of either the massive modular mining moving magic machine, the Galaxy, or the Banu Big Box Bogner Bazaar, call the Merchantman. One entry per video, just be a member and be entered automatically, or subscribe and comment with the secret word. And the secret word for this video is the jargon I coin for a scene that illustrates the concept in Star Citizen, but shouldn't be taken as strictly literal. Fly safe, keep it real, and I'll see you in the verse. This is Daniel Raymond for Ray's Guide.